Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here. Check out the series. You know what to do. You like what you hear. Hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. I am so excited today to be talking with Devon Nixon about uh, this brand new HBO series called Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. Hello. Hey, how you doing? What up, Kyle? How you doing, buddy? Shout doing out to Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is exciting, man. This this series that you've been in here, Winning Time, again, the rise of the Lakers dynasty, it, it's not only that you're in it, and we got to point this out from the beginning, you're playing your dad in this, Norm Nixon, as we yeah. talk about the uh, the Showtime era of the Lakers. And, and I know this is probably the most uh, basic, obvious question to start with, but how did this happen? Because tell me you didn't have to audition for this. No, see, that's the common misconception. Everybody thinks that they just offered it to me. And um, I actually found out about it through a friend, and he texted me. He was like, you should play your dad. So I immediately called my manager and my agent, and they got me audition. I had an audition go, go the same route as anybody else. Um, had a pre-read, and then I got a call back, and I nailed it, I think. So uh, now here I am playing my, my pops, but... Yes, I definitely had to audition. And the funny thing is they didn't even know I acted. They just literally thought that I walked off the street. I was my dad's son. They didn't really know anything about my previous work. So it was, uh, it was, it was cool. I walked in there with, you know, like just, <laughs> it's just like a regular dude. So it was fun. I'm curious what they were looking for then. I mean, obviously, you know your dad well. I, I'm guessing, uh, you know, some assumptions there and everything. But, you know, when, when we talk about, especially when portraying real life people uh, in, in moments like this, you know, mannerisms, like what was it play here? How on, you know, on, on the spot did you have to be impersonating wise, I guess? Well, they gave me a lot of freedom because it is my dad. So I actually just sat with him for a while and, you know, I, it's my father. So I grew up with him and, you know, I just try to mimic some of his mannerisms, you know, his dialect, he comes from Macon, Georgia. So he has like a kind of a little bit of an accent. So I definitely put that in there. And um, in terms of, you know, the physical aspect of everything, I called him and I was like, how much did you weigh? He was like 163, 162. And at that time I was like 187. So I dropped the weight within two months through intermittent fasting, working out like a maniac. Um, I had him train me on a court, show me some old school moves, some signature moves. And yeah, I think I did a pretty good impersonation. <laughs> I think I did it spot on, you know? So um, I obviously can't ball like him because I wouldn't be acting. <laughs> I would, I'd be playing for the Lakers right now. But uh, yeah, man, so it was, uh, that, 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 was that, that was fun to, you know, hang out with my dad. And through this process, it made us even closer as well. So I found out some things about him that I didn't necessarily know. And it was just a good, um, good way for me and my pops to bond. Yeah. Did you grow yeah. up at all with the stories of that time? And, and I don't know how close you were in the scene. I mean, obviously pretty young when it was happening. Right. But, uh, but like how much exposed uh, to this story were you in real time? Well, I was born in 83. So probably at the height of their era. Um, I literally remember going in the locker rooms when I was a kid, but I don't remember too much. So what I had to do, I had to go back and watch tape and just ask him, you know, he would just sit there and tell me what it was like, you know, him growing up in Macon, going to Duquesne in Pittsburgh, and then being a number one draft pick for the NBA. And he was just so determined because he came from humble beginnings. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good to, you know, really just pick his brain, I feel like. I feel like that was, like, a really cool experience for me. Like I said earlier, it just made us closer to this whole experience, you know? Yeah. It's interesting, too, because, you know, when we first meet Norm Nixon in, in this series, uh, uh, you know, pardon, I'm going to use the phrase here, he's on the defense. Yeah. Uh, you know, very much like, like, so coming into it like that, and I, and I don't know if you got to talk to your dad about that side of it, too, but... But, you know, the, the image we get of Norm from the beginning is, is of being threatened. Uh, what was it like yeah. kind of portraying that side? That was interesting because, you know, it's, it's truth. Of some of it, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty truthful to his character. He's inherently competitive, you know, and him having been on the team two years prior, 
them not winning, and this new hot shot, flashy kind of player comes in. And just like anybody, like if somebody is going to try to threaten to take your position, you know, you kind of got to, you know, put all your cards out and just show them why you belong here. And I feel like the scene in the pilot when I'm playing against Quincy one on one, it was kind of like a hazing. Like I'm the head of the fraternity. You're not just going to come in here and take this position. But throughout the, the show, we develop a brother, like a big brother, little brother kind of relationship. And um, it just, it, it was more, it became more of a situation of how are we going to work together rather than go at each other's throats. And that's what I think that they did. And, you know, they were the fastest backcourt in the league for years, him and my dad. So, mm-hmm. you know, especially with the pushing of the tempo and my dad's favorite coach was Jack McKinney. So he just loved that system and that system worked and it got adopted by Westhead. It got adopted by Pat Riley who went on and went even more after my dad got traded to the Lakers. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you you mentioned that game in the in the pilot. Uh, Norm's playing magic at a party, yeah. and 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 was your dad that stylish as uh, as as what we get to see at that time? Because the costumes are great. <laughs> he, was, he was he was he was stylish. I love putting on the mink coat. But um, <laughs> one of his only things he came to set and he was like, "Man, I never wore a fur for a coat." But I did some research and I called him out. I'm like, "What's that, huh?" <laughs> What are these leather pants that you told me you never wore, man? How come I'm Googling all this stuff that you're saying that you never did? And, you know, I get a pedicure. He was like, I never got a pedicure. He's definitely got a pedicure. So it was just fun to joke with him that way. But, um, yeah, he was very stylish. Always had a good sense of style because he played in Italy as well. Mm-hmm. So he would always get custom-made suits. He would have, like, the flyest loafers, uh, flyest belts. You know, him and Spencer Haywood, he told me, had the most style on the team. So that's that's a little nugget of wisdom. I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> well, it definitely yeah. fits that that era that we you know we hear about. Um, I was I was only I was born in eighty one. You know, just a couple of years before you. So so I uh-huh. kind of caught up with all that later. But but it was such. I mean, this was the beginning of the NBA. Of course, that you and I grew up on the superstar era that would eventually birth Jordan and everything that came after that. And right. and. And it's also interesting, I guess, I don't know the timing wise, did you all talk about this coming on the heels of the, uh, of the Jordan documentary, the last dance when that came out? Oh yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, this was already um, in production and the idea was already about to be made. Cause I remember Jim Peck, one of our producers had read the book. He's actually the one that brought it over to Adam to make this thing come to fruition like it has. But it was already in the works. But I think that the Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, was, was incredible. And I think everybody loved it. Even if it wasn't over COVID, I think that people just wanted to see that side of Jordan because he was very, you know, withdrawn from the media. And these were interviews that nobody had seen. And I think that that is definitely going to give us a little momentum going into our series as well. Um, because I think everybody's just about basketball right now. And, you know, we're, we're all playing for the current Lakers. Um, they're not doing so hot, but, uh, <laughs> I think this is going to get people excited about the franchise again. And yeah, there's just it's like, I don't think that there's, there have been too many sports shows or documentaries per se, like the last dance in our show. And I feel like what makes our show so unique. I'd like to say that the way we film the basketball, we kind of created a new stylized, uh, look and take on how we how we how we film things. For example, there's a guy going through uh, all of the basketball players while we're you know putting like doing a play, and he's on rollerblades filming everything like you're in a video game. It's awesome. We had a camera that was like on a mop, and some guy was on skates, and, and the camera looked like a broom. We had you know the the Super Eight cameras. We had like uh, there was a camera that zipped from one side of the arena to the other. So there's like so many cool different ways, but I definitely think the last dance is going to get people excited. I, I think that made people love basketball. I mean, there were always basketball players, mm-hmm. I mean, basketball fans, but I think that the last dance definitely did it. made people hype for our show. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and hearing about, you know, how you all went through that, um, and also knowing Adam McKay, you know, being a part yeah. of this and especially directing that first episode, which, you know, has got his style all over that. You know, I, I hope yeah. you don't mind the broadcast, uh, broad question. What was it like working under him? Because 
because he has developed such a definitive style, whether we're talking about the fourth wall or, you know, the, um, the graphics and everything that comes along. Like for you, what was that experience like? Oh, Adam, that's my boy, man. I've never actually had somebody direct. Like he would have a speaker in the room and he would talk through a microphone <laughs> and, and direct like that. Sometimes he would come if he wanted to explain something in more depth, but it was like a concert. Like I was at a concert. He'd be like, yo, Devon, hey. So let me, do and it was just like a big boom box almost like next to me. Also, he just gives you that creative freedom, like just to live in the moment and do whatever. I mean, he he's very big on improv, as you know, and ad libs. So he he would come up to me and be like, "All right, give me two for for me, and then the rest are for you." Meaning, do whatever you want, basically. Also, what I had to learn is that you always have to be acting when you're around him, because no matter if you have all the lines in a scene or there's 30 people in a scene, he knows how to make that camera find you, you know, with the, with the zoom ins on the reaction. So what everybody started to learn, what I noticed going into, you know, uh, hopefully we get a season two, but I always have to be on, you know, because there were some days where we had brutal basketball practices and some of us were tired, but I think it worked because we were in a game situation, but he would zoom in and just show us on the bench or talking and that's his style. And, um, it was really, really, really cool because you have to be just just in the zone. And I like that because he challenged me, you know, because sometimes actors get a little lazy. If they're off camera, they're not doing anything. You know what I mean? Right. And I've been a, I, I'm, I'm actually someone who did that at one point. But uh, now, you know, working with a such a powerful network like HBO and these directors and our great castmates, you always just got to be on. And that's what I learned. And that was one of the greatest things that he taught me. So I up my game a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting looking at this too, because especially as we're talking about uh, Adam McKay, you know, there's always a point, there's always a point to the shows that he does, to the movies that he does, whether it's, you know, uh, don't look up as we saw, you know, the wall street or something like that. And I, and I kept trying to think of like, what was the major point of this? And, and I don't know what it was for, you know, through your eyes, but I started looking at the celebrity, of course, just the celebrity of the eighties. Was that also something that you all talked about? Like what beyond entertainment, what is this? This is a story that tackles so many issues, between race, political issues. Uh, then you've got things like style and fashion of that time. And like you were saying, the celebrity. Um, I think that Jerry Buss was an innovator. He's like one of the first to have people like Jack Nicholson, uh, Angelica Houston, you know, Lou Adler at those games. And he's one of the innovators of, you know, cheerleading, like Laker girls. It was just so like, like that blase blah back in the day he made it sexy and fun and cool um you know and it just taught me i mean there's a lot of aside from basketball each individual character has their own struggles and there's so many but i think you do a beautiful job of deep in, uh, of diving deep into each player and coaches or whoever characters personal lives and seeing how they came which most of them came from nothing like jerry west um you know, you got Pat Riley, he was an announcer, you know, then became a coach. And it's just so interesting because watching the series, there was also some stuff that was revealed to me that I didn't know. So I think it's going to be very informational. And I think that it's just going to be fun. And that's what I think it meant to me. And that's kind of what I got out of it. I got a history lesson as mm -hmm. well, aside from just basketball, you know, it was but, really cool. Yeah. And especially, I mean, I think we all expect some some comedic elements to anything that he's involved with too, as we're talking about Adam. But uh, but opening up, you know, the first thing we see in the very first episode, it's magic in the doctor's office. We know this story. We know where this is going and everything, and that's not yeah. comedy right there. That's that's the opposite direction. You know, for for you, for an actor to play that line, I mean, that's got to be its own fun adventure in itself. I I, I would I would guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a dark comedy. There's some moments he does a good job of finding those moments that the audience, whether it's with the score behind it, you know, there's a lot of serious moments. And then we had a lot of fun. And that's why I think they changed it. At first, it was like a drama, sports, biographical kind of piece. But now I think it turned into dark comedy because as you see, <laughs> Jerry West, well, I love, that's my boy. I love Jason Clark. 
every moment he has, even sometimes when he's being serious, they're hilarious because he's just such a spaz in the show. And then somebody like John C. Riley, you know what I mean, who's known for comedy. But there's some very serious moments um, that he has, you know, especially what happens, you know, with his mother and stuff. I'm not going to give it away, but I mean, people can look it up, but I want people to watch. I mean, there's some very serious moments where he breaks down and I got to witness that. Um, For myself, there's some serious moments, like in the second episode when I'm talking to, you know, Jason Clark, we have this conversation and, you know, Jerry West gave in real life, you know, me and, me and my, him and my dad kind of butt heads a little bit. They're cool now, but, you know, there's very serious moments when I'm talking to him. And I just think it works beautifully together, man, and a, a mesh between comedy and drama. And I think that's what's going to draw people to the show because naturally, in, inherently, they're going to be like, oh, Adam McKay, this is going to be all jokes. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that it has some depth to it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, you know, as, you, as you're saying, Hopefully, yes, there is a season two. I, I want this thing to go on as far as they can take it. But that's also yeah. the question. Like, do you get a sense of where they want the story to go from here? Yeah, I mean, we have another championship to win. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we have a couple more. So I think that it's kind of like euphoria in a sense, right? You see how each character, and there's so many that didn't get to tell their story in the first season. So I think if we do get a second season, which I'm hopeful and praying to God for, um, I think it's going to take some of those characters that we didn't necessarily dive deep in their personal stories. Mm -hmm. Because there's only so much you can cover in 10 episodes in one season, you know, because basketball is a huge focus of it. So we had to, you know, get that in there. And then, you know, like I said, we highlighted certain characters. But the second season, there are some characters that didn't like get kind of the the highlight that um, some like characters like you know John C. Riley and it delves deep into their story. So I think second season is not only going to highlight those characters that didn't get to shine in the first. Um, like I said, we have another championship to win, man. So we'll see. <laughs> I would love to be way more drama, man. Way more drama. If you read the book. We've only tapped into just like maybe, maybe 10% of all the stuff that we have to tell, you know, all the stories that we have to tell. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, it is a beautiful story. It's it's fun to watch, as you mentioned. I, I also want to wrap back around real quick here because, you know, obviously, as we've talked about, you didn't follow in your dad's footsteps. You went the acting routes. We saw you very young. It is the 30th anniversary of The Bodyguard this year. Um, yeah. One of the great yeah. movies. Uh, yeah. Do you go out on a boat much these days? Uh, I'll oh, ask man. jokingly. <laughs> uh, that is hilarious. No, man, I love boat riding. I could swim too, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, man, it is a 30th anniversary and the way time flies is so crazy. And I still get recognized from that role um, because there's some diehard fans out there. Yeah. You know, people go crazy. I was a part of another great film called Terminator 2. And the little bit that I got in there, people still were like, oh, we were Danny Dyson. I'm like, huh? <laughs> That's strange. Um, so yeah, that was an incredible experience. Uh, and, you know, Whitney Reston in peace. She was a wonderful woman who definitely taught me a lot. Kevin Cosner became a buddy of mine. Ran into him a couple of years back, knew exactly who I was, such a sweetheart. And um, shout out to the bodyguard 30th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> you got a, uh, uh, not to put it on your spot, you got a favorite Whitney story that, that you like to tell? Because again, oh, what, I have a lot. one of the greatest. I have a lot. So one, I mean, it, you can look it up. Um, Whitney smoked cigarettes. So I remember one time I didn't want her to smoke. And literally I went into her trailer and flushed her cigarettes down the toilet. And you know somebody on that nicotine fix? <laughs> she was so bad at me. And my mom's here. My mom could vouch for that, actually. She was so pissed off beyond belief. It was crazy. And then there was another story, because when I was filming in Lake Tahoe, that was the very first time I had seen snow. And wow. um, one of the ADs was teaching me how to make a snowball. So I literally threw one at the back of her and Kevin's head, and I literally just started an entire snowball fight. <laughs> and it was so much fun. One of the most memorable moments of my life. Literally, like, 100 people. 100 people just throwing snowballs at each other it was, it was yeah man I, I that 
wow, that was now you're making me think of all those times that I had with all them. It was a great experience, man. Yeah, we yeah. filmed in Tahoe here. Um, and they went to Miami. I didn't go to that one, but I, I loved Lake Tahoe. It was such a beautiful thing that lake. Let me tell you something else. All right. I'm gonna tell you a little secret since you brought me out to the bodyguard. So the scene where I jump and I get tackled into the ocean, right? Or the, I'm sorry, the lake. I was in a jacuzzi. So how they filmed that, right? They filmed the top of the jacuzzi. They had like a standalone jacuzzi and they put the camera up high so that the jacuzzi would look like a part of the lake. Wow. So when I, yeah, it was really cool. If you look really close, you can see the steam coming off of my jacket, actually. <laughs> so, so that's a little secret that nobody knows. But yeah, it was really cool the way they shot it. Because everybody always used to be like, was that water freezing? And I'm like, nah, I was chilling. It was like 100 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> nice little movie so, magic right there. Movie magic, man. Movie yeah. magic. It held, it, the, the movie holds up well. I didn't know about the 30th anniversary, and, and I didn't know that we were going to eventually be doing this interview. It was about a month ago. I just It was on you know one of the streamers, and it's like, man, I haven't seen this since I was young. Put it on yeah. for the hell of it, you know? Still yeah. holds up. That's a great movie. It really is. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You, thank you. And I know uh, I'll wrap up with this uh, because uh, I guess the next thing, or maybe we're actually seeing, are, are you pulling double duty right now on TV in uh, Snowfall? Is that right? Yeah, man. Yes, the next thing is Snowfall. And I think my episode airs the 23rd, March 23rd, I believe. So then I will have waiting time in Snowfall. So Sunday and then Wednesday. Um, and that's, that's cool. That's only ever happened once in my life. I was on a show called The Hard Times of R.J. Berger and Secret Life of an American Teenager at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but these shows, like here, you know, I love my game a little bit, the production and the, and, the, and, the, and the quality of actors that I'm working with are just, have upped my game so much. And I'm so happy to be a part of Snowfall as well. Damson is incredible. I saw him at the Laker game. And you know what, one thing about Damson, he plays Franklin, he throws me off every time he starts speaking in his accent because he's British, <laughs> you know? So like, he sounds like a, a real hardcore gangbanger from L.A. on the show. And then he'll be like, hey, Devon, could you pass me some water over there? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then the switch is just so crazy. You know, but um, so far, my character is completely different from, obviously, what I'm playing in, a, um, in Winning Time. Um, it's a little bit more rough, a little bit more raw. And, you know, I made some cool character changes. I can't wait for the world to see, man. Can't wow. wait for the world to see. Well, yeah. congr congratulations on all of this. And again, I've had so much fun watching this latest series, Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. Devon, thank you for taking the time to talk about it, man. This has been really cool. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me, Kyle.